Following their championship season, the Knights went back into their school routine. Focused on graduating and training for next year, the days quickly turned into weeks. Everything seemed fine until one morning, the morning of April 18th, Uh, it was devastating. It was absolutely devastating. Uh, getting a call on the way into work at about 7 a.m. Uh, it, it was tough. It was tough news to swallow. That day was horrible. I got the text from coach and I just like sat there in front of my phone for like 20 minutes or something. Just didn't know what to do. It was probably about 7 in the morning and coach sends a group text to the team like basically saying like, yo, Nate is gone, but everybody get to the gym and let's, you know, we gotta talk about this. And everybody was just in shock. I'm like, what the fuck do you mean Nate's gone? You know what I'm saying? I'm like, like, yeah, he killed himself. I'm like, what? Hey everybody, it's Cindy Matalucci, your host of The Pulse and Live with Cindy. Today is Friday, August 31st. We have a very special show for you today. I'm, I've been trying to put this together for a long time, so I'm finally happy that it's come to fruition. This show is dedicated to mental health and wellness. Um, it's a serious topic. You know, we are all about fun on the show, but I think this is something that really needs to get out there. We really need to start this conversation. Um, in light of all the news and the media stories on suicide and on depression, we need to tell people how to ask for help, right? We want to offer a platform and a show that can address some of these issues and get you guys the information that you need to spot the, you know, the signs of your friends and your families and your loved ones that are having issues that you might not know that they're struggling from. We've all been touched by mental illness in some way, anxiety, depression, and I really want to dive deeper into this conversation for you. So my goal today is to be a resource. Um, we are streaming live on Facebook, so if you have questions on Facebook, we'd love to take those questions for you. I've already had several phone calls from people that had asked you know, pretty intense questions because they're struggling with things in their lives. So contact us directly. We will help you get the resources that you need um, if you don't want to, you know, talk to us on Facebook because we, we understand that some of this is private. But before we get started, I want to introduce my guest today. So um, I'm really happy that you guys are tuning in. I've got Dr. Daisy Boscan today with me. She's California licensed psychologist and psychoanalyst. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited to have you here. I know you and I have been going back and forth for weeks. For weeks, <laughs> yes. Trying to get you know the schedule and everything. But um, I also have David Pradell with me today. How are you? I'm, I'm doing well. Thank you for having me on the show. Yeah. He's a college mm -hmm. television and film student at San Diego State University, and he's going to be sharing his documentary and his experiences of what's happened in his life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Today, so thank you so much for being. Yeah. It was perfect timing when you reached out to me about you know possibly coming on the show because I really wanted to put this together. Yeah. Thank you. So thanks for being here, you guys. And then we have coming up um, after the commercial break two amazing entrepreneurs that are going to be sharing their story. But before we kind of dive into the topic, Dr. Boskan, maybe you could just educate the viewers a little bit on what you do and how you help. Yes, uh, I'm a psychologist and psychoanalyst. I treat um, adults and children with depression and anxiety. Um, I uh, like to work with people who are um, struggling, that they haven't found a, a right place in the world. And um, I serve as a source. Um, I go deeper into what makes them unhappy uh, and self-destructive. Well, and you're a member of the faculty at the San Diego Psychoanalytic Center, too. Yes, right? I'm a member of the San Diego Psychoanalytic Center, uh, where I teach. Uh, I also supervise psychiatric fellows at the UCSD Department of Medicine, um, School of Medicine Department of Psychiatry. I supervise postdoctoral psychology graduate students, and I've taught for many years and served on, on different boards, um, national and international. And we'll have access to um, Dr. Boskan as far as being a resource. We can get you her information. Everything's on the website. It's actually on the links as well, how to find you. And we also have the 800 number up today, the suicide hotline, which I think is really important because that's something that we're going to talk about as well. So that's going to be running as well for you guys today. But before we kind of get started, I wanted to talk to you, David. 
tell us a little bit about your experience because you were at your final year at San Diego City College mm -hmm. when you when everything kind of happened. So talk to the viewers a little bit about your experience with suicide. Yeah, so um, going into my final year at City College, um, I personally was struggling and kind of in a dark place um, because of just college life and stress and 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 I was diagnosed with an eating disorder and I had lost like 30 pounds in that summer um, and and I was feeling so sick and in a dark place so I was just going through the motions at that time thinking that I wasn't in the right place but um, I wanted to get my degree and and so I school started and I ended up following the men's basketball team at San Diego City College and that was able to kind of distract me and while following the men's basketball team um, you know kind of reassured me that I was in the right path and and the men's basketball team were so supportive and positive uh, in my career following them during the season and one of the players on the team in that year Nate Edwards he was always supportive and positive towards my work and you know making videos and so that really touched me and and I really kind of was able to get out of the dark hole that I was in um, that summer first half of the year and uh, so I followed the team and that happened to be the year that they won the state championship title and I had all this footage and all this you know game footage and of the team and photos and but sadly after they had won the state title um, Nate Edwards the player who always went the extra mile to help everybody even the, on his team or outside of the team like me he ended up taking his own life um, just as the year was the school year was ending and it was out of, it just was kind of out of the blue and you I didn't expect it and um, everyone else in the community didn't didn't think about it at all and he had kids too right yeah he um, was a father of two um, with his girlfriend and he was getting ready to go to a four-year university and graduate and he had signed his letter of intent to play basketball on the next level and uh, it was just um, you know it was it's hard to describe still it's been in more than a year and to know the type of person he was even when he was in a dark place and he helped me get out of the dark place and I never told him how much it helped me um, you know in my life that um, it was just so hard to know that for someone so positive and so helpful for to everybody um, he was in a dark place and and uh, sometimes I feel like it is the people that are there for everyone else that are struggling the most sometimes because they don't have like an outlet but you but nobody knew he was struggling right I mean wasn't that mm -hmm. one of the things I mean no one he never really reached out to anybody yeah he, uh, here in the oh, from what I heard he it was kind of just kind of kept into himself and from what I heard after following his death um, his mom that lived back in New Jersey in his hometown and his girlfriend they tried to um, get him to uh, talk to somebody and get him help that, that he needed but um, from what I heard and from what I know now is that he was so I guess he could, yeah I don't know like the, the mental illness that he was going through was so powerful that he couldn't be swayed to get help and and that's what hurts is to know that he was suffering he, he was in such a dark place that um, he couldn't he couldn't help well and and I have I have a question for you because yes. this is really something I think that we need to address are we I know that we're very focused on ourselves it, it, today right we're very focused on what's happening but we need to kind of be focused on the people in our lives right so are we missing symptoms is there something that you can tell us that we maybe, maybe we're doing wrong or what should we look out for is there something that we can look for I think as a society we're so busy we just go 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 all the time and uh, sometimes we don't have time to really think about the people who is next to us or um, if, if people are changing behaviors we never think oh is that person depressed or that person is needed help is and, and, and again most people who commit suicide they they usually don't tell anyone the people who talk about suicide is the people who they're in pain and they want to be helped 
but the people who are in that darker place they don't want they want to be they want to be done yeah. and they they don't talk about it because talking about it implies they would get you know help. they will get help I mean we cannot force an adult to go to a mental health professional uh, unless you are suicidal and someone knows about it, they need to call the police, 911, and they will take him to an emergency room. Mm -hmm. But apart from that, if, if these people are in such a dark place, again, we don't understand their dark place, we understand our dark place, and if we have used or can use how we felt when we were in a dark place mm -hmm. to help other people. But we should maybe look for them changing their personality. Is well, that something? Would you say? Yes, we, we usually off maybe. Yeah, we usually we usually look for change in behavior, um, signing off all your property, signing off your bank account, uh, not talking to people. Um, uh, withdrawing uh, from society, from friends, not going out. Something is unusual for, for the people, for the friends that you know. Then that's why you have to think about it. Are you okay calling the person? Are you okay? Mm -hmm. Do you need any help? Uh, most people that have, at least in my practice, that feel suicidal, they, they talk about it because they don't want to die. They're just in such a pain that they want to help. They want to understand why they feel that way. Um, as a society, we look at ourselves, we work out, we eat healthy, but then we don't want to kill ourselves, right? So the people who actually are in that, such a dark place are the ones who do not want help because they just, it's so bad. And it's usually a mental health issue, either bipolar disorder or uh, severe depression, and with the sense of no hope. If you lose the hope for life, for future, for anything, then you're in serious trouble. So, and also if you lose the purpose of your life. What is the purpose of life? We all need a purpose to live, mm -hmm. to work, to be happy. And if, as you, you were telling me about your friend, he had a great purpose. He was playing uh, basketball. He had two kids. So who knows what, where was he with his darker place? Well, and that's one thing. You know I love my staff. So, um, Anxiety and Depression Association of America. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the U.S., affecting 40 million adults in the United States age 18 and older, which is 18.1% of the population. Anxiety disorders are treatable, yet only 36.9% of those suffering receive treatment. So there's a reason that people aren't going to get treatment. Is, that, is, it, is it the stigma of, of, of having an issue? Yes, there's a stigma sometimes uh, not having access to, to clinics, to, to professionals, to clinicians, but nowadays in the United States most people have insurance and they can access a crisis line and they'll be able to find a clinician for them. The stigma and then uh, the, the denial that I'll be fine and I'll be okay and I can cope with it and some people drink, some people do other things to be able to cope with those feelings but mm -hmm. they're not addressing the underlying issues, why they are depressed, why do they want to kill themselves, why they're anxious. Mm -hmm. There's so many reasons and also your own personality, your own temperament, your own constitution, your support system, your environment. So there's so many factors that can address and can impact someone uh, who, is not, who is dealing with a mental illness but it's nothing to be ashamed off. And when you were going through the stuff that you were going through, because you had your own issues with eating, and did you ever seek help? Yeah, I did. I went to the doctors and they gave me um, a card to call. Um, and I did, and they said I had to wait a month for an appointment. Um, but by that time, I was like, wow. I was kind of ashamed. And, and I didn't, like, when I called, I was like, I didn't know like if I wanted to do this, and but to hear that, I never called back, um, and I just was went to school, and then that's where I met Nate, and and that's why I did the film because he was so influential on me, kind of um, it's getting a back great late for you, yeah, and getting back to normal health, and and um, so I knew if he was still here, he would most likely be tell, or he would ask me or told me like are you going to make a, a bigger video project about the whole team winning it all because um, he was so about the team and so about the players on the team and, and in the documentary the players t um, talked about him being so um, helpful and, and, so, and going the extra mile to help everybody and, and I wanted to honor his memory with this film and and share a glimpse of who he was um, and, and the type of person he was. Mm -hmm. And through the images and the, and the games that 
um, you see him on the court and you know and you know every night he was so supportive of all the players and you know he was on the team everybody um, described him as being the heart and soul of the team he uh, he was that guy that that always made always went out the way to put a smile on your face and and uh, so th I met him in my last year and and I I just wish he was here and and so well yeah. and, and I think that the other thing is I mean we feel like it's weird to talk about it because everyone thinks oh it's a stigma you know I if I put it out there it's it's so personal but I mean it, we saw Kate Spade take her life we saw Anthony Bourdain we saw celebrities a lot of that really yes. hit home this year I think for a lot of people so I think that no matter what, everyone's struggling. I mean, you can be a celebrity, you can have all the money in the world, and that's not going to make it better for you. So, you know, you have to you have to reach out. And then I think the other issue is the stigma of medication, because now in our society, people don't want to be on medication, right? It's like, oh no, I'm on medication. But I know personally, I've had people um, in my past. I've had a, a previous boyfriend that had bipolar. He was on medication. It was, cr I mean, it was a lot. But it's like if you're not on the right medication you can't get better, right? So isn't that a big aspect of being on the right medication? Yes, I think medication helps uh, with the physiological symptoms of depression, the mood disorder, but I think a combination of medication and, and psychological help is the best, best uh, treatment. One of the things I find um, uh, really sad, and, and also a warning for people who know someone who have committed suicide, uh, the tendency, uh, there's an unconscious pull to, to you join the death, uh, the deaf person. So you have to be careful. If you are very close to someone who have committed suicide, I will really warn you to seek out, to talk about it. Go to see a psychologist, a friend, because it's something that we don't understand. We don't understand why that person did that. It was a, it's an action of rage, it's an action of anger, and then the tendency is for, for for because we're humans to want to join that person because we love that person, we we miss that person. So I encourage uh, patient, uh, people who have you know uh, experienced this very close to you to actually seek out help and talk about it. And then my last question, because I know we have to go to commercial break. Um, 911. I had somebody call in to me to tell me a little bit about their struggle this morning. Um, they had to, somebody in their life wanted to commit suicide. They were not close enough to get to them. They called 911 and the, the cops came and arrested them and then it, you know, kind of treated them like a criminal is what they said and it, it was, it made the, the person feel really bad and obviously embarrassed. So it kind of drove a wedge, even more of a wedge between two people and now they're trying to figure out how to seek help. So my question to you is 911, obviously if you're in a situation, is that the best thing to do? If somebody you know has contacted you and said, I'm gonna do something, is, yeah. that what, is that what you would recommend? Yes, if you cannot get to that person, you first, you call 911, you give them the address, you tell them what, what the person told you, and then they will dispatch the police uh, department, and if they're suicidal, uh, tendencies or actions, they will actually dispatch the, t the PERT team, which is the mental health uh, people who work with the police department, and then they address the issues of what's happening to you, and then they will take you to an emergency room, um, the closest hospital. And if you know somebody that is dealing with suicidal thoughts and depression and anxiety, you know, just go to the hospital, go to the emergency room, and then they'll be able to, you know, channel you to to the, the right place for you to seek out help. I'm surprised that you had to wait for a month before you got treated, because that's a long time. And usually when people call us, if we don't answer the phone quickly, <laughs> uh, they they don't call us back. So we, we know that there's an urgency. And if we engage the patient as soon as they call us, then we'll be able to help. But I just want to say today, because I know we're going to go to a commercial break, um, reach out to those people in your life. You know, just take a second. It only takes a second. Even if it's just a feeling that you have, because our intuition is always re really good, right? Reach out and just contact that person that maybe you think they're having a bad day. Maybe maybe it's not anything, but if you can change the, the course of the life and you can make a difference, reach out to those people today. Um, I try to do that on a regular basis. People that I know that are struggling, um, you know, 
reach out and just do something just to make sure that those people are okay. So Dr. Boskan, she's going to remain with us. We have the suicide hotline number up, um, drboskan.com is where you can find everything on her. And then David, you are at YouTube. People can search you for your information. Mm -hmm. And David Pradell Photos, right? Yeah. On Instagram and Instagram and, and Facebook, David Pradell Photos. And then on YouTube, David Pradell. And, and the documentary is titled The City's Champions. So, um, and you get to know the story about the basketball team and about Nate and who he was. And, so. and then hopefully we'll see you at a film festival too, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. So if any, all my film festival people out there, this is amazing. He did a really good job. So um, Thank you. I, I really appreciate you being honest and sharing your story. <laughs> so you guys, we're going to take a quick break. Um, on Facebook, we will remain live, but we're taking a quick break for um, the other channels to show a little bit more of the documentary mm -hmm. from David. Thank you. Um, you can watch it again on his YouTube channel, and um, we'll be right back with two amazing entrepreneurs that are going to share their story, and we're going to continue the conversation. All right, we'll be right back. Focus on graduating and training for next year, the days quickly turn into weeks. Everything seemed fine until one morning, the morning of April 18th. Uh, it was devastating. It was absolutely devastating. Uh, getting a call on the way into work at about 7 a.m. Uh, it, it was tough. It was tough news to swallow. That day was horrible. I got the text from coach and I just like sat there in front of my phone for like 20 minutes or something, just didn't know what to do. It was probably about seven in the morning and coach sends a group text to the team, like basically saying like, yo, Nate is gone. Pretty everybody get to the gym and let's, and we gotta talk about this. And everybody was just in shock. I'm like, what the fuck you mean Nate's gone? You know what I'm saying? I'm like. Like, yeah, he killed himself. I'm like, what? The family lost one of their brothers. They lost a champion. Nate Edwards was gone. A victim of an illness that turns the brightest days into the darkest. The dark thoughts and pain from inside slowly crushed the life of a vibrant and caring father and brother cousin and son. It just hurt because he was always like the person to me that was so positive. And like, whenever I had a problem, he helped me through it. And I just feel bad because I can't help him through it. <laughs> I wished that I, I could have talked to him one more time. And, and then so I thought about, you know, the, the pain he must have been in to, to, to do that, you know, to take his own life. He must have been in incredible pain. Um, so I thought about him being in that pain. And I thought then I, then I thought about his, his family and, and his, his young sons who adored him. So dealing with all of that was, it was heartbreaking. To, 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 to come to terms with, the, with that kind of loss, you know. Uh, I was devastated, because uh, you know, Nate. Hey everybody, welcome back to The Pulse Live with Cindy. I'm your host. Today's our special show on mental illness and mental wellness. Um, I, if you saw the first part of the show, we were talking about David and his documentary and everything that was happening. Um, we did show you both parts of his documentary, um, a little glimpse of it. So definitely check that out. It's it's a it's a it, an intense story, but I think it's something that really needs to get out there. So now our second part of the show, we have Dr. Boskan, who's remaining with us as our expert. Um, we are still taking questions on Facebook, and then we have two amazing entrepreneurs that are willing to share their story, who I'm big fans of. So we have Marissa Alejandra. How are you? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> and Janice Noel. Doing well. Thanks for having me. We're so excited to have you guys. So. Um, 
I wanted to start a little bit with the fact that you guys are so brave to share your stories because I know it's putting putting it out there. <laughs> but Marissa, I want to start with you. You've been on the show before. We we go back a while. We <laughs> <laughs> we've done a lot together. We network together. Um, we're friends. We we've done events together. So um, I I know her really well, and I'm. She's a, she's a number one. She is a, has two coaching companies. So tell everybody quickly a little bit about what you do, so they can get to know you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I started with an intuitive eating coaching company, um, health coaching, and I was working with women who struggle and men, some men, uh, with uh, emotional eating and binge eating, and um, you know, really just their relationship with food. And as I got into this world of dealing with people's emotions and how do we overcome or get through or process emotions, it really expanded into a lot more life coaching and just helping people move through challenges and that sort of thing. So that's what happens. <laughs> well, I love that. And we talk a lot about um, you know being an entrepreneur and how it's not easy. And I know, Janice, you're an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Tell everybody quickly a little bit about what you do, because you have a PR firm. I have a PR company, yes. Yeah, so I do everything from like the business development, get media people on for media attention, like your show, for example. <laughs> and here I am like on the show, and I'm usually the one on the sidelines. But um, yeah, and you know, helping out with social media. So I have like this tremendous amount of, of this having a company, but um, it's just, but it is what it is, and I do love it. So um, that's what I do. Well, I love that. Well, so I want to start with Marissa a little bit because um, you and I have talked a lot about this. Marissa and I were talking for a while about doing a show because we both laugh. It's not funny, but it's true. We laugh because it's people are only posting good stuff on social media, right? Not the authentic, what's really going on, the struggles. I mean, some people are. I'm just saying that you see a lot of the perfect filter, the perfect life. People feel like they have FOMO. They feel like they can't live up, right? It, my life isn't good enough. So that's one of the things that I wanted you know, to address with you. And you, you've been so authentic on your social media. When you're having a tough day, you put it out there. You don't hide it, which I love. But you were stuck in a lot of like self-sabotaging patterns and negative self-talk, and you've had a lot of things that you've gone through. So can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, um, I, I think it's really just important for everybody to know how normal it is to feel and experience emotions, whether it be circumstantial or not. And so I feel like it's really important for me to share that information on social media so that people feel like they can be themselves and they can feel like it's okay for them to feel that way um, if they're sad or whatnot. And so I do a lot of reflective posts where I talk about, okay, I'm feeling this way and then how did I work through that and you know, how did it turn out in the end or how do I feel about myself after and what did I do to get there? Mm -hmm. um, which is a lot of what I work with my clients on. You know, What tools do I use to move myself through those spaces of those emotions? Um, but I, I, as an entrepreneur, I went from having a successful career in academia and decided that I was not wanting to sit in an office all day and wanted to do something more with people and did not sit in front of the computer and um, decided to pursue a health coaching you know, um, certificate and did some intuitive eating work. And I was in obesity prevention before, so it wasn't too far of a jump as far as education goes. But it was a totally new experience being an entrepreneur having a stable income to not having a stable income and you know just I think as a person in education or in academia, you get really comfortable talking about what you know and and in your field and you're just studying and reading all the time to getting out there and being a salesperson and being an entrepreneur and talking to people and trying to have people sign up as clients and things like that. And it was a completely new experience. And there were so many failures leading up until that point. And, and not only that, I was doing personal development and I was you know, volunteering and working full time and starting this business. And so I was leaving my house at 7 a.m. and getting home after 10 p.m. almost every day. And I was exhausting myself. That was the biggest thing, I was exhausting myself. And it did not suit me at all. I, I didn't have anxiety before. I was a very confident person. And then all of a sudden, I had spoken in front of hundreds of doctors and scientists and whatnot with no problems. And then all of a sudden, I'm like sitting in front of a bunch of women talking about intuitive eating, and I, I can't stop shaking, and I'm nervous. And I'm going, wow, what happened to me? Where did the me that I know go? 
And you know, part of that was the failure and dealing with something new and the challenges of that, but part of it was me just being so busy and overdoing it and not, you know, and then focusing on the wrong thing. So focusing on what I was not doing versus all of the things that I was accomplishing. I was a model citizen. I was, you know, like, I mean, honestly, I was volunteering. I'd started a nonprofit for you. But you weren't youth giving yourself and, any Yeah, credit. no, none of that credit for any of that, you know, and mentoring like a young teenager. And, and all I was focused on was what I was not doing or where I was not succeeding. Um, and so it, it took a lot of work and reading and processing and whatnot. And I mean, it's a great experience now. I can look back and see like these are so many things that I can support my clients with now, but to kind of move through the spaces of those emotions. Well, and I have to agree with you on that because when I was at Paychex, I was in the corporate world for like 17 years. So it's like I was in sales and marketing. I was working my way up the corporate ladder. I had the six-figure income. And I was like, obviously, it wasn't what I was mm -hmm. on the earth for. And I wanted to get out of it and do my passion, which is the pulse, which is my pulse baby. But when I did that, you know, I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to have so much free time. I'm going to be in the best shape of my life. I'm going to be this and that, right? And then I thought, because I had always been successful in everything, I, I jumped off and thought I could do it you know, and, and ramp it up so quick, right? And, and it didn't work that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and being an entrepreneur, you're like you said, you're wearing so many hats, you don't have any time for yourself because you're doing everything in the beginning, right? Until you have like the right team in place. And so- And I, you're investing tons of money yeah. <laughs> at the same time. Yeah. I mean, can we say I had a 401k and I <laughs> might not have one? <laughs> right. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, like there's so much anxiety because I feel like you felt I didn't feel like myself anymore right right I'm like where was that person that was so confident I gained like 20 pounds I was stressed out I was mm -hmm. like who is this person I'd look in the mirror this is not me I couldn't sleep for six months mm -hmm. I went through a phase where I was literally I could not sleep which is the worst thing for you same. ever yes. I did the same thing yep <laughs> I never had anxiety and never had depression and I went through bouts of that so I guess my question for you Dr. Mm -hmm. Boskan since we're kind of talking about this is how do you know when it's some time to check in with somebody? Is it when is it not normal, right? Is it like it's mm -hmm. been six months and it's not normal now, or is it? Well, anytime uh, people go through changes, I think uh, we tend to just go at it 100 miles an hour. And I usually say be cautious in all the changes that you're going to make, moving, getting married, uh, setting up a new firm. Uh, you, you, any changes that we do can create um, a lot of anxiety, tension, and I go back to how did you handle those changes growing up? How did your family change uh, growing up? How your parents, uh, who are the people in, in our life from the beginning, handled the changes? Were they positive? Were they worry? Did you hear you know people complaining about oh uh, it's going to be it's going to be scary? Don't go there. Don't do this. Don't do that. So all the negative talk that yeah. we were. Uh, received from our parents, environment, school, is going to actually bring those feelings of, of anxiety and low self-esteem and low self-worth because we move in the system. We are so accustomed to, you know, to the routine. So I say to people, just be cautiously optimistic about all those changes and do them slowly. <laughs> I like yeah. Slowly. Well, and I think that just starting the conversation, I, there's a quote on Facebook I wanted to read that Marissa wrote, which I thought it really resonated with me and I thought it was very deep. So I'm going to read this quote. I've never been diagnosed with depression or anxiety, but I've experienced deep moments of both. I'm sharing this for those of you who feel alone and like you're the only one who struggles with dark feelings. I felt disrespected, betrayed, stupid, unlovable, like a failure, that no matter how hard I tried to make things work, no matter how logical and honest I was, no matter how nice I was, it just wouldn't turn out the way I wanted it to. So that was super deep and I, I feel like you gotta it, put it out there, right? Yeah, the, that was, I wrote that a little while ago, right? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, I think it was, I, I hear from so many of my clients, like, I can't believe I feel this way. And I felt that way even, like, I can't believe that I feel so bad about this. I remember getting an assignment because I was at a personal development program. They're like, write 10 things you love about yourself. And I'm going, I, I don't even know right now. I was so far into the negativity that I couldn't write 10 things that I love. I mean, that's simple, that's easy, right? And that made me depressed, right? So I was like, now what's wrong with me that I felt that way? Why do I feel so sad about this? And so your logical brain is going, okay, like, 
I shouldn't be so upset about this, but I am. Mm -hmm. Or I shouldn't be so sad about this, but I am. Or this isn't that big of a deal, but I am. And it was, for me anyways, it was the process of just accepting that it's okay to feel that had me not feel so, that would like let me process it faster. I love that, I love that. Well, I just have to say follow her on social media. I mean, you're just amazing with everything that you do. Um, but I wanna kind of dive deeper into some other things. So Janice, you, mm -hmm. I know you're with clients all the time. You're trying to get your clients in front of people. You're pumping up your clients, yes. right? And then you, two years ago, had a son. Yes. And struggled from postpartum. I did. It's something that is very, very real. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about it because you're, you're carrying this child for nine months and you're so close to it and they're born and you're like supposed to be ultimately happy. But what people don't realize is that everybody has a different situation. And I was in a situation where I was running this company, was already going, going constantly a mile a minute. And I had reconnected with, uh, with a relationship and we had our baby and he, he, I was in the situation, he chose not to be involved. So here I was in this state where I was like, suddenly I had a business that was one baby and then I was becoming a single mom. And so I was really had struggled with how was I gonna do all of this? It's a hard enough to plan like when you're going to breastfeed. And that's another thing that there's so much out there, pressures above of motherhood these days. Like, what's the right thing? What's the way, you, oh no, 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 you can't do this. Like, it's like every two hours. <laughs> oh, it's called every hour sometimes. <laughs> and I was like, I was, and I was that mom, I was like, I took the breast pump onto meetings. I had Preston on my, on my, on my side and, but, you know, but one thing that people said was like, baby, you, how are you doing this? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. But when I realized that I really truly needed help was shortly after my son was born. And how I recognized that I really needed help was that I strangely was holding him and I felt this disconnect with him and that I couldn't explain it. And there was one moment where I went into the grocery store and I'm pushing my son and my mom's next to me and I, I didn't even feel like I needed to cry and it just, tears just came streaming. And I was like, this isn't, how is this possible? Like, no, I, I, I had accepted the situation of that I was being a single mom and I had this beautiful baby boy. How is this possible? And I immediately was like, Mom, I, she was my main support system through through everything. In in any type of depressional situation, you really have to have that support system, whether you realize it or not. And I was one of those people that, with like with my business, I felt like I constantly do everything. Yeah. And I was a little bit in denial, like, oh, I don't need help. I can do this on my on my own. No, that's where I really had to stop myself and ask for help. Mm hmm. And um, I had went to my went to my doctor, and I told them about what was going on, and they immediately got me some therapy and yeah. some medicated help because you have to get happy very very quick when you're a mom. Well, and it's also like you it's supposed to be the best time of your life, right? I'm gonna right. Have to and yeah. I feel like that's like the stigma too. It's like, wait, why am I? And I, this is so, so normal. I've talked to so many of my friends. Yeah, and it's and, and it doesn't take very much. I think that's <laughs> one thing that people have to understand. It's like. I had a situation, but it, anything can trigger it. Yeah. postpartum depression, just like anything. And so that's something that people need to realize. And it can go in stages very quick. And one thing that I thought was really strange is you know, after I had my baby, I was already overwhelmed as it was. I didn't have any sleep. I had to practice breastfeeding. We had to go through all the tests and make sure everything was healthy and normal. And you have a moment with the social worker and they tell you there's this thing called the baby blues, and then there's this thing called postpartum depression, and there's this thing about psychosis, and you're like, <laughs> it was, I was, I was oh, so surprised. Say, did they talk to you about that when you were having the baby? Did your doctor that's that That's after, and that's one thing that I feel like really needs to change, is they need that's to prepare you say. beforehand, because you're, they don't you know, warn you. No, they don't. Um, and one thing that's actually really staggering right now is that maternal death is at an all-time high in the United States right now. Wow. So for any such reason, so if there was things that they could do, like when you're actually caring, there's so many things that could 
could help that. Well, and do you know how many people suffer from postpartum? Do we know what the, the, the percentage is, or how common is that, would you say? I don't have the statistics, but there's a big difference between having the baby blues and then having uh, right. postpartum depression okay. and having postpartum depression with psychotic features, which means that you actually have suicidal thoughts and homicidal thoughts oh where uh, a mother uh, can't even stand the baby next to them um, mm -hmm. and that is concerning. So you need to find the help and it's real and the overwhelming uh, feelings of I cannot take care of you, right? Yeah. I, I have this other life thing in front of me that I need to actually feed and take care of it and I can't do it and you overwhelm and so you collapse and, and then by talking about it with your doctor I'm feeling very depressed, I have no attachment to my ba to my infant. It's really hard to say by the way. I encourage moms to talk about it because it, just because you're talking about it doesn't mean that you're going to you're do not it. A bad person. Mm -hmm. No, and you're not, not alone. it's just normal. <laughs> you know. I have two dogs, I can hardly maintain my life. <laughs> so you guys that have kids, I'm it, it's so much, you know? So it's like I I feel like I'm stressed out. I can't imagine how you do it all. And then on top of that, dealing with the feeling the hormonal yeah. side of it. Or and the, at, at the time, it's like when you also are an entrepreneur and self-employed, there is no paid maternity leave. Like right. I still had to take my time and balance my clients and still work and have the help of Nanny and my mom and, you know, to help this keep it all going. Otherwise, there was just, there was no way. And I, again, I don't know how I did it. <laughs> I still think about that every day. But you're feeling good now. Absolutely, yes. And I mean, my son is an absolute blessing. He's a joy. I just, I love having him every single day. And, you know, and like, Part of me did realize, was like, I have this beautiful baby boy and he's my everything, yeah. so, and I have to be my everything for him. And so that's what I have to remind myself every day to keep myself in check. Yeah, and I think we just can't be so hard on ourselves. Um, I try to do that on my Instagram, on my social media. I try to post the unfiltered stuff because I feel like as much as it's great when you look so gorgeous on your Instagram, everybody does post a good filtered picture every once in a while, we're not gonna lie, but <laughs> we do want you to know that it's a struggle, you know, and everyone's struggling. And I really like that the celebrities are starting to talk a lot more about postpartum. I know Alyssa Milano came out and revealed she was hospitalized for anxiety and depression after the birth of her son. Chrissy Teigen's talked about it a lot, and I think that's really great. It, it, anyone out there with that conversation, getting it out there, um, talk about it. But I think that what you pointed out, there are different aspects of, of postpartum. So you really need to you know, watch the signs, right? Watch the signs if it's your wife or, you know, that's, that's, or your friend that's you know, struggling. Yes, watch the signs and also I think the gynecologists and obstetricians should do better in asking mm -hmm. the history of depression. There's history in your family of depression and anxiety because if your mom had depression, most likely you're going to experience depression mm -hmm. and especially when it's a stressful event like having a baby. So anytime that um, you have a very stressful event, to check yourself out, you know, just go talk to, to, to your friends, to clinicians. And I think that the most important thing, you need to have people, mm -hmm. um, a very good support system, uh, therapists who can help you, psychologists who can actually help you through this process. Right. Mm -hmm. So we are society of um, everything instantaneous. You know, we want to gratify ourselves very quickly. Ugh. And it just hit us. It can hit you really badly if you don't right. take your time to everything that you need to do. And self-care, you know, just mm -hmm. it's, it's important. Yeah, I think that's a big thing. I mean, that's something I, I run a, a women's group of uh, female entrepreneurs, and there's 86 of us, and every single one is just so stressed out and, and not taking the time for yourself. So I think you know, taking the time for yourself, talking to someone, having a support person that you know you can count on, um, having an outlet of some sort, right? Like mm -hmm. boxing, which I will get back to once my shoulder heals. Um, but something that you can do to make you feel good about yourself, right? And just starting the conversation. Um, so I, I don't know. I mean, can you guys at least leave us with your leave us with your websites and your information? I would love for everyone mm -hmm. to um, leave us with that before we go for the live show. Absolutely. Um, everyone can go to my website at janawellpr.com um, on the contact page. If you have any questions at all, you can reach me directly that way. And I'm always happy to help in, in any way possible because this is something that I'm very passionate about, helping moms and children and so all of everyone can get healthy. I love that. Well, thanks for sharing your story. Thank you. And Marissa? Yes, um, marissaalejandra.com and I'm on Instagram and Facebook that way as well. 
and she's great with coaching. So, and we'll have the links for everybody's information on our site. And then Dr. Boscan, Dr. Boscan uh, dot com, and I have my phone number. And there's a way you can reach me, and you can send me a question, and then I'll I'll call you and I'll I'll tell you what I think uh, you need. And I'm going to put you in touch with a few people, too, that have already contacted us. And again, I just want to say thank you guys so much for tuning in. This means a lot to us. This is a great conversation that needs to be started. Um, everybody's been affected. And I just hope that we helped in some way. Remember, you are not alone. This is something that everyone's feeling. And um, we'll have this link on our website, and we'll have contact information for you. So thanks so much for tuning in, guys. We'll see you next time when we put our finger on the pulse of San Diego. Bye. Bye.